Welcome to Municipal Affairs, the show dedicated to diving deep into the matters that shape municipalities from across Canada. Now, we are excited to bring you insightful stories, engaging discussions, and exclusive interviews with municipal leaders from coast to coast to coast. We have lots to dive into as we were off last week for Thanksgiving weekend, so let's get at it. We will be talking about municipal reaction regarding the ongoing Israel-Hamas war. We will chat with a mayor from Nova Scotia regarding the housing crisis. We will be discussing a code of conduct complaint in North Bay, Ontario, and then we'll also be discussing councillors from across the province of Ontario speaking up regarding their mayors wanting to propose strong mayor powers. But first, we head to a global story that has municipal impact. The ongoing war between Israel and Hamas began on October 7th, 2023, when terrorists invaded Israel from the Gaza Strip. The war began early Saturday morning with a barrage of at least 3,000 rockets aimed at Israel from the Gaza Strip. The latest number of Israeli killed since the start of the war was at approximately 1,300 people, while 3,400 were wounded, according to Israeli news outlets. Now, the terrorist attack in Israel has sent vibrations across the globe and has municipal leaders here in Canada reacting to the ongoing war. Vancouver City Mayor Ken Sim said, quote, the city of Vancouver will always stand with the people of Israel, end quote. Mississauga Mayor Bonnie Crombie said, quote, Israel has a right to defend itself. My prayers are with the civilians and everyone impacted by this horrifying violence. Guelph Mayor Cam Guthrie said, quote, the terror attacks by Hamas on Israel are senseless and horrific. We stand with our local Jewish community as they watch with concern and feel heartbreak from afar. Let us seek peace and stand together to condemn these actions, end quote. Georgina Councillor Dave Neeson said, quote, sickening to see the terror unleashed by Hamas against innocent Israeli citizens. These acts of violence must be condemned. Israel has every right to respond and defend itself, thinking of all those affected both globally and locally. Markham Mayor Frank Scarapitti said, quote, I strongly condemn today's terrorist attack on Israel, including the assault on innocent civilians. I join the international community in expressing shock and anger and hope for peace. Delta Mayor George Harvey said, quote, the city of Delta unequivocally condemns any act of terrorism and expresses its profound solidarity with the people of Israel, as well as those in our community and around the world with friends and family in the region, end quote. Calgary Mayor Jody Gondek said, quote, my heart is with the Jewish community in Calgary, end quote. Winnipeg Mayor Scott Gillum says, and I quote, I have spoken with leaders of Winnipeg's Jewish community to express my support. Our thoughts are especially with residents of Winnipeg's sister city, Behir Safa, during this time of crisis, end quote. In the Saturday morning press conference, leaders from Southwest Saskatchewan voiced their apprehensions about the presence of the self-proclaimed Queen of Canada, Romana de Dulo, and her followers. Safety concerns have been raised, prompting a coordinated rally organized by worried citizens in Richmond, Saskatchewan. Now, the mayor of the village, Brad Miller, said that the community wants the federal and provincial government to get involved to help the community deal with the ongoing encampment. We are gathered here, I guess, for one thing and one thing only. As a community of Richmond, I'd like to say we're standing together as one. And our focus is to move her out of Richmond and hopefully back into the United States and then it won't be a Canadian Saskatchewan problem or a Richmond or a Southwest problem. And uh, it's probably been about a month now and I would like to say my main concern is also we have bylaws for the town of Richmond and for Saskatchewan. And I think for the provincial government and also the federal government, like Monsieur LeBlanc, I think they should be getting in this so we don't have this problem anymore. And we can work together with the RCMP and push people out like this that are sort of taking our community safe and health and bringing it down to a low that the mental health is experienced is above and beyond that people can not control and they have to be helped out whenever they are needed, I guess. 
Richmond Mayor Miller also said that he just wants them out of their community. I would just like to go like this and she was gone tomorrow morning would be the best thing. That's what it comes down to. Now, in a show of solidarity with the small town, town of leader Mayor Aaron Wenzel said that he was standing with Miller and the community of Richmond as it could have been leader that the encampment was set up in. You know, this could have been just as easily leader or any sector or possibly any community in the area. So we wanted to be here to you know, show support. There's going to be several citizens from leader here today to, to help push this out. And we just want to ensure that uh, we're working regionally to you know, know they actually have their backs and that uh, we want to ensure the safety of our community. So happy to be here to support. And Sean Checkley, mayor of Fox Valley, Saskatchewan, said that everyone in the surrounding communities have been on high alert since the arrival of the group in September. Unfortunately, everybody in the surrounding areas, um, you know, on, on high alert, if you want to say as well, and, and they're, they're anxious and, and, and things like that because of what's happening here, right? Um, so, yes, there has been some some situations that have been brought to leadership of, of the communities um, in the surrounding areas' attention. Um, lots to do around the school um, in, in, in Fox Valley. So it's it's definitely something that, that we're aware of and and, uh, and we have direct communication with the leader RCMP detachment as well, who's who's been there supporting all the communities um, with with support and, and listening to what's going on. So y yes, there's you, you can't go through. Um, to get to Richmond on the Saskatchewan side of the local and past Fox side. So there's, there's definitely uh, um, a link to that corridor and, and same coming from the north, you're going to go, be going through leaders. So um, it's, it's, it's one of those things where we're aware of what's going on and, and uh, we have to work as a collective group because like Brad said, and it's not just Brad and the village of Richmond saying that we as leaders in the Southwest want them gone. They cannot be here um, uh, causing people um, that anxiety for, for a reason, and to the point is, we don't want to wait till something happens. Now, according to reports, the self-proclaimed Queen of Canada and her supporters have been residing on a privately owned former school property in Richmond, Saskatchewan, ever since they were compelled to leave Camsac on September 13th. The situation has drawn attention, particularly as the self-proclaimed queen has garnered notoriety in the eyes of the U.S.-based Anti-Defamation League, which has labeled her as the Canadian QAnon figure. The organization's description of her includes allegations of advocating for violent action against those involved administrating COVID-19 vaccines on children. Local MLA Doug Steele said that his hope is the group either moves on or becomes part of the community. Like I said, he went back and talked to the Minister of Justice and he communicated with the, the RCMP and they come up with a, a plan to moving forward, you know. And, uh, you know, with their expertise, I know they all have all kinds of expertise and, and they can, you know, assist us through this. It's, uh, it's a little overwhelming, like you know, Brad was saying earlier, you know, the folks in, here in the community of Richmond would get up in the morning, walk their dogs, it's quiet, and now you don't know who you're going to meet up with. You know, it's pretty intimidating in the evenings when you don't know who's wandering around your streets and these types of things. And, you know, these communities are not uh, communities that are going to chase anyone away that wants to be part of the community and, and uh, supporting, but they don't know what they're dealing with. And, you know, with the history and the social media that you see out there, well, it creates a, a larger awareness than it used to be. They got chased out of one community and end up in Richmond, and unfortunately it was a local person that said, hey, this is a place to come, that there's some infrastructure you could utilize. But in the same breath, the communication wasn't there. And you know, this community here has some great infrastructure, very nice homes. You know, it was uh, the product of a lot of industry, plus agriculture industry. People are looking at moving from other provinces to have that peaceful time as they're getting older to come to our communities. We're fortunate that way now in Saskatchewan. We went through some times, well, you know, it was a, a lot of void there, but you know, these are the communities and we just hate to see this happen. You know, to chase those folks away and there was one sale pending here for, from a, a senior that was going to go to a community with more services. And all of a sudden the folks that were gonna buy it were <clears throat> wondering what's happening here. It was possibly not gonna happen. 
So, you know, if this can transition, move on, or become part of the community one way or another, peacefully and, and properly, I think that's all the community is asking for. And like I say, as your MLA and the representatives of government, that's my job and our job to stand behind, beside them, and hopefully we can, you know, encourage this. The discomfort among Richmond residents and those in the surrounding areas has only intensified over the last few weeks, with many expressing unease about the cult-like presence of the group in their small community, which boasts a population of just over 100 residents. Now, the unease has been compounded by the village's location, situated just north of Maple Creek, Saskatchewan, approximately 45 kilometers west of Regina, and is in close proximity of the Alberta border. The growing unease within the community has prompted a sense of urgency in addressing the matter at hand. As developments continue to unfold, residents are hopeful for a swift and amicable resolution that prioritizes the safety and peace of their community. Cross Border Interviews invites you to join our show and share your passion for public service. We want to hear from you about your inspiring stories and insights on how you're making a difference in your community. Join us on Cross Border Interviews, where leaders from across Canada come together to discuss their communities, their commitment, and their service. Let your voice be heard and help inspire others to serve their communities as well. Contact us today and be part of the conversation. Together, we can build stronger, more connected communities. On October 18th, Manitoba Premier-designate Wab Canoe will be sworn into office with his new cabinet. Canoe and the Manitoba NDP brought an end to seven years of progressive conservative rule in the Keystone province. Canoe's party secured a victory, claiming 34 out of the 57 seats in the legislature, while Heather Stevenson and the Manitoba PCs were reduced to 22 seats, the Manitoba Liberals holding on to just one seat in the Provincial Assembly. Now, Canoe last week held a series of meetings with key municipal officials, including the Association of Manitoba Municipalities President Cam Blight, Winnipeg Mayor Scott Gillingham, and Brandon Mayor Jeff Fawcett. During his meeting with Blight, according to a provincial media release, Canoe highlighted the significance of essential investments. Quote, I was pleased to speak with Mr. Blight about the importance of healthcare and infrastructure investments, solutions for rural crime, and ensuring rural voices are heard at the table. End quote. Now, in a separate meeting, Canoe sat down with Winnipeg Mayor Scott Gillingham and used the opportunity to strengthen their working relationship. Canoe noted in a press release, Mayor Gillingham and I further strengthened the positive working relationship between the Manitoba government and the city of Winnipeg and reaffirmed our commitment to working cooperatively for the benefit of Winnipeggers and all Manitobans, end quote. Mayor Gillingham echoed the sentiment, sharing his thoughts on social media, stating, I'm really encouraged the new premier and I are on the same page on several important issues, most notably the urgency in addressing homelessness. We share a vision for a coordinated one plan model that is inspired by the city of Houston and includes a housing first approach with relevant support services. We made a commitment to meet regularly and work as a team to take on the challenges and opportunities that Winnipeg faces. I look forward to more discussions in years ahead, end quote. The conversation between the new incoming premier and the city of Brandon Mayor Jeff Fawcett revolved around the pivotal role that Brandon and Westman region play in Manitoba's economy. Both leaders expressed their unwavering commitment to support the agricultural sector and to address the pressing issues of chronic homelessness and drug trafficking in the region. Mayor Fawcett said of the meeting, quote, we had important discussions around infrastructure, health care, agriculture, BUACC, and ongoing municipal investment. The Westman region has a strong economic future, and we look forward to building on that to benefit all Manitobans, end quote. The mayor of the city of Woodstock, Ontario, is expected to take on strong mayor powers, giving his city access to a $1.2 billion incentive fund for municipalities. Once he and his city commit to a new housing target set by the Ford government. The extension of the strong mayor powers to Woodstock is expected to take effect October 31st, with Mayor Jerry Akinone saying he plans to sign on to the home building pledge himself. Uh, we can all surely agree that there's no question that the availability and affordability of safe, 
appropriate housing is a significant concern for Woodstock. I believe committing to the provincially assigned housing target and working with the province is the most effective way to address the local housing crisis. After confirming our intent to achieve the housing target of creating 5,500 new housing units by 2031, I look forward to working with my council colleagues to develop Woodstock's housing pledge. The pledge, which is to be submitted to the province by December 15th, will outline the strategies and actions we will take to achieve the housing target. The pledge is also where we can identify creative solutions to address our reservations about how some of the recommendations in the Housing Affordability Task Force report could apply for here in Woodstock. While we may have concerns that being able to access the Building Faster Fund is tied to strong mayor powers, as voluntary participants in this process, we will have access to the tools and incentives provided to advance some of our local issues. As a partner sitting at the table, I also believe we will have a greater opportunity to voice our concerns and advocate for change. While the $1.2 billion Building Faster Fund won't cover all the infrastructure costs needed to support Woodstock's growth, it will help reduce the burden on taxpayers and provide us with some funding to support local housing related priorities, including things like affordable housing or increasing residential densities as identified in our strategic plan. As a partner in the solution to increasing the housing supply, we can advocate on behalf of our residents for the things that motor matter most. This was not something we asked for. However, as we learn more about the, this legislation, it appears there may be ways to navigate this new governance model while preserving the democratic process that we value. Unfortunately, the term strong mayor is a distraction from the intent of the legislation, especially within the confines of a two-tier system where planning authority as well as water and sewer operating authority resides with the upper tier, the ability to stray far from the status quo is very limited. One after another, councillors from the city spoke up against the move. Councillor Kate Leatherbarrow didn't hold back against the report that was presented to council regarding the strong mayor powers. Um, but I also take issue with that uh, the mayor of Woodstock went on Heart FM on Tuesday ahead of our public meeting. And so when I hear the word democratic process, I think that outlining your report or sharing um, an opinion of what you've put together is one thing, but essentially telling the community not the full story, not the full truth, not the full impl implications, which a lot of we don't even know. I feel like that's a disservice to the democratic process. Um, I certainly didn't get a phone call ahead of that meeting, and I take issue with the fact that it was glazed over the implications that this strong mayor powers will have just solely on budgets. Nowhere do I read anything about the 2025 budget. I only see 2024. I see the wording as voluntary participants. I am not volunteering for this. And I know a lot of residents in the city of Woodstock are also not volunteering for this. And to that point, I thought a lot about, you know, the campaigning period. Obviously I ran in 2018, I didn't make it. I waited four years and I worked really, really hard to be here. And we are a citywide council. We don't have words here. We don't have, you know, I'm responsible for 2000. Councillor Tate's responsible for 5,000. Who might reach out to Councillor Tate is not who's reaching out to me. And then we collectively come to a decision or an action item that we feel will serve everybody. I am responsible for 50,000 residents. So I don't agree with what you've written. I don't agree that there are holes and uncertainties that do not serve the Woodstock residents. And further to that, I just feel if I looked at this as like a business deal, I'm going into business with a friend, colleague, or, or neighbor. Before we send it off, you're going to have back and forth drafts. This is the first draft, and it's not good enough. So I will not be receiving it as information. And I am deeply frustrated that Mr. Mayor and a lot of mayors across the province have sat on this information long before August, but for us, August. And we're now under the wire of how we're going to be transparent to the community, and I will not accept this, so therefore I won't support it. Councillor Bernia Wheaton said that the mayor says he will be judged by how he uses the strong mayor powers, but she believes he will be judged in other ways. Doing this for the money is very short-sighted. 
I think that this council has made a wide variety of financial decisions that are much bigger than this, uh, with a much bigger financial impact. And I'll refer to the building next door, the purchase of that. I will refer to Southgate Center expansion, much bigger price tags. Um, in exchange for, in, in a opposition to this, four to five million over a handful of years is not worth the the jeopardizing of the, demo, uh, the democratic process. So I think that this is very undemocratic. I think reducing our elected voices in exchange for the promise of a relatively small amount of money um, it, is pretty ridiculous. Um, a one-time potential payout, you are exchanging that for the future long-term in perpetuity of this council's democratic process. And I think that that lacks vision. And I think it, honestly, if I'm, it, it lacks leadership. I think that this provincial government has walked back on so many things in the last few months that 1.2 billion is a pretty easy number for them to change their minds on. And I even question whether there is 1.2 billion available for this kind of an incentive. A Woodstock, and I've said this before, we are 0.0037% of the $1.5 million housing target. We are not the province's savior when it comes to housing in this, in Ontario. Um, I feel that by talking to the media about strong mayor powers, uh, and I'll echo what Councillor Leatherbrow said before talking to us, um, it, it sets a dangerous precedent. I think it was unfair to us as councillors. I think many of the comments you made in that interview were very misleading. You were very pointedly asked the question, is this just about housing? And you said yes. And it is not just about housing. It is about budget. It is about hiring and firing. It is about senior management teams. It is about committees. It is about many, many, many things. And I, I, I feel like your comments uh, were misleading to the public. Um, you said in your uh, interview that you are willing to be judged on the way you use strong mayor powers, which is an incredibly bold statement. Uh, you will not only be judged on how you use them, but you will be judged on how you don't use them. And I can think of a handful of people out there right now who will scrutinize every decision and every action, and it will form the basis of their campaign platform in 2026. Councillor Connie Lauder says that the strong mayor powers wasn't just about housing, but was about other things as well. But I do not agree with the strong mayor powers legislation that the province has tied in with the provincial housing targets under the Building Faster Fund. This is terrible le legislation which could harm our democracy going forward. I do not believe the position of mayor should have the powers set out under the strong mayor powers, such as firing or hiring a CAO and other positions within the municipality, setting budgets, et cetera. The list goes on. These should be decisions of the entire council. What we require is affordable housing, which this does not address. There is no guarantee it will happen. When they say affordable, I say affordable to who? I thank the mayor for this detail, detailed report with the information he has to date as we requested our, at our last meeting. Council voted six to one last week with all but the mayor backing a motion saying it does not support the use of strong mayor powers and wants the mayor to outline how he intends to use the powers tied to the housing commitment. Now, it should be noted that the mayor does not need councillors approval to sign the pledge or take strong mayor powers. The city of Woodstock is one of the 21 smaller Ontario municipalities Premier Doug Ford announced at the Association of Municipalities of Ontario getting new strong mayor powers. The expansion of the powers is aimed at getting 1.5 million new homes built by 2031. Join us on Municipal Affairs and let your brand shine where it matters most in the heart of local communities. Get in touch today and learn how you can make a meaningful impact on municipalities from coast to coast to coast here in Canada. Your success is our mission, and together we can build stronger, thriving communities together. Reach out today. In a bid to address the growing housing crisis in Nova Scotia, Municipal Affairs and Housing Minister John Lohr and Andy Fillmore, Member of Parliament for Halifax, in late September, revealed a substantial commitment of $83 million towards the development of 222 new public housing units. The construction of these new units is slated to take place on provincially owned land adjacent to existing public housing developments. 
The locations earmarked for these developments include Bridgewater, Kentville, Toro, multiple sites in Cape Breton, and several locations within the Halifax Regional Municipality. Now, for these smaller municipalities, this may be seen as a win as they are dealing with a housing crisis similar to their larger urban municipality siblings. Now, we sat down with Bridgewater Mayor David Mitchell about the announcement and how he welcomes the news of the new housing in his community. But as the details are not fully known yet, the Bridgewater Mayor cannot be sure if the necessary municipal infrastructure is in place to accommodate the new development. Um, Mayor Mitchell, thank you so much for doing this. I, I, I want to talk about the housing crisis that municipalities are facing across Canada right now. And recently you made a comment to a news uh, outlet in Nova Scotia about how the housing crisis is not just a large city mm. issue. It also is an issue that municipalities like yours, the town of Bridgewater, are dealing with. Can you talk to me about how the housing crisis has impacted your community? Sure. So, so I would say that when I first joined council in 2004, um, people sleeping rough were not something that you saw. Now, to clarify that comment further, there were people that were homeless. We've never, I don't think, ever had a time where people, they, there was not someone in that situation. So I don't want to, people to think we're naive and thinking, oh, we never had that issue. I'm sure we have. But it wasn't something that you saw. And then a few years ago, it became visible. Um, but still, in the grand scheme of things, people would say probably a small issue, and maybe it'll work itself out. Now, it is not just visible, but it is visible in large numbers. Um, and so, yeah, it is definitely not a Halifax-only problem, I would say. If you're a politician in any community in Nova Scotia and you don't think you have people who are sleeping rough, then you are not engaged with your community. Every single one of us would have this. Towns face a more challenging issue because... Um, the supports are here, or at least there's the belief that the supports are here. So that's another issue. But so, um, you know, they would come to the urban centers because this is where, well, for our town, this is where we have a Souls Harbor and the food bank is here and things like that. But I think, you know, you know, the hospital's here. Um, but what we've seen even in the last year is a doubling of that population of people who are sleeping rough. So how does how do communities like yours, the town of Bridgewater, deal with this issue? Because the housing crisis is one aspect of it. You're talking about the houselessness uh, population as well, which is another aspect of it. Yep. But you have to sort of navigate what's best for the community while trying to help people who are coming to your community from other municipalities, other rural areas, and looking for those services that to be offered to them to sort of help them get a leg up in the housing issue. So I want to sort of start with the first question here, but how does a small municipality like Bridgewater, and I say small in the grand scheme, like Halifax, Toronto, small, how does a municipality like Bridgewater start to try and address the house housing crisis at a smaller level than the federal government giving money to Halifax, Toronto, St. John's, Fredericton. So what are you doing on the ground right now to sort of start addressing some of those issues? Yeah. And I think, I think the, the other thing to, to remind people uh, uh, on this topic, because it's very difficult is housing is not a municipal issue. So again, complicating all of this is that we don't build houses municipalities don't build houses. We are not going to have a department of housing and we're not contractors. That is a provincial mandate. Um, so it, it gets blurred because I get a lot of people saying, you just need to build more houses. I, I had someone the other day yelling at me as I was uh, on my little scooter going, you know, when are you going to build me a house? And I stopped and I said, the, is, are you asking me like, is the town going to construct you a house? Yep. Yeah. No. Now we have other things we can do. And we talked about that, but um you know that I think that layers on top of it is the question is always what are municipalities going to do about housing and and for us we we changed um, eleven policies and bylaws to allow my job is to allow more housing to occur so we are trying to remove all the barriers so if someone says I want to do a tiny home or I want to I want to add a granny suite or I want to have a garden suite or I want to put a, a second story on my garage we've made it so yep yeah, yep 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 if you want to do it. Let's do it. I want to convert my basement to an apartment. Yes, perfect. Perfect. I'm trying to get, we are trying to get everything out of the way so that housing can be done. 
infrastructure not standing. <laughs> are developers coming to the table right now? Are developers wanting to develop in Bridgewater? Yeah, because so that is one of that, the, one that's of the... the aspect that I think a lot of people forget, right? Because you, you're right. Municipalities do not have a role in building houses. They have a responsibility about permitting, bylaws. That's great. But yeah. if developers do not come, the municipality can't just go hire contractors and build 100 houses and hope that people buy, uh, buy them. You're hoping that developers will come in and build subdivisions, build apartments, or even have people in the community convert their houses into duplexes or fourplexes or uh, yeah. granny suites. So are people actually wanting to build? Because we see that there's a big push for builders in Toronto, Halifax, but are people wanting to build in smaller communities like Bridgewater right now as well? Oh yeah. So so a okay. uh, little bit of a little bit of fun useless trivia. Uh Bridgewater is the only community in all of Nova Scotia that has not had a single year of declining population since 1985. So even Halifax can't say that. So um you know like you were getting that, close Mayor to Mayor Mike Savage. That's right. Take <laughs> that Mikey. Uh so yeah, so almost 40 years of of sustained population increase. Um for the last 5 years that has gone like this. So for a little bit of context, we have about 4,000 um, units, let's call them, housing units in Bridgewater. We've already approved 2,500 more um, with a potential 2,500 more coming to the table. So that goes back to our infrastructure issue. I don't know if we're ever going to be able to approve the next 2,500 just because we need to ad address that. But we've approved you know, more than 50% increase in housing stock over the next decade, but it's been approved in Bridgewater. So the, the developers are interested in Bridgewater. Our proximity to Halifax makes it great. The twinning of the highway is gonna cut 15 minutes off that drive. So we'll be less than an hour from downtown. There's a whole bunch of things going for us, jobs and services. Um, so yeah, there's not for a lack of developers. Some is of those- buy-in are... from the residents? <sighs> yes and no. So again, it goes back to that communication and explanation because not all of these are building affordable housing. So then it becomes, we need more affordable housing. We don't need these, you know, apartment units at $1,800 a month or $1,900 a month. So yes, we absolutely need more affordable housing. But what happens is there's a phenomenon called NOAA, naturally occurring affordable housing. So what happens is if someone moves out of their hundred year old home or moves out of their smaller apartment into one of these newer units, those units become your naturally occurring affordable housing. They're still at the rents that are well below, uh, in some cases below market, but they're at least at, at old market rates. And then we we try to work with them to, to see what we can do to make them more affordable. Um, so yes, we need more dedicated affordable housing, which is part of this. It is happening, but you also need all price points of housing to free up that older housing stock. So on that flip side, I, I know the, I guess the the reason I wanted to talk about this was because the provincial government, uh, to, uh, the progressive conservative uh, government in Nova Scotia, just came out with their four communities that were going to get affordable housing, mm -hmm. government run affordable housing or government yep. owned affordable housing, which Bridgewater was one of them. Yep. You openly have said, we'd love it. We want it, but we don't have the infrastructure to deal with this right now. And we need infrastructure money. Yep. I know you and I've already talked about this, but I'm going to ask it again because I think it's more, most, most important. How do you get the provincial government to invest in infrastructure along with housing? Because infrastructure is traditionally a municipal issue. It's, it's a municipal it's, role. You're 100% right. And this is where there's that disconnect that we talked about earlier. It's trying to get the message across that. And this is this is probably going to be the topic that gets that message across. So the province announces... Um, you know, 21 of these units are going to be in Bridgewater. And my response was, I don't know if you can have them. Uh, and so, so the reaction was, I don't understand, like, don't you want them? So yes, I desperately want them. I think the announcement is phenomenal. Like, you know, hats off to them. First time in 30 years that that provincial housing is being built. Brilliant. Fantastic. And I, and I did, I did say that to the premier. I texted him. I said, this is, this is great news, but <laughs> uh, you need to have a conversation with us because we don't know if we have the capacity for these. And so you want housing, we want housing, but housing also must include infrastructure. You can't just drop a house somewhere without all the, all the services that go with it. And so you have to also understand that housing includes pipes. 
right? Housing includes electrical and it includes plumbing inside the house. Well, just make an understanding that there's, have an understanding that includes the pipes that go plumbing outside the house. So I think we're almost there. Now, you, 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 you are the mayor of the town of Bridgewater. I'm assuming you're having conversations similar to this or having conversations with your municipal counterparts from across Nova Scotia. Are they saying the same thing? Are you hearing the same thing when you talk to the mayors of other smaller communities like the size of Bridgewater? Yeah, uh, yes. So it's so complicated. This is so complicated because towns are only part of the province. So our situation in Bridgewater is not unique to Bridgewater. Every every town is having a similar st struggle, right? So I, pipes. I, the, the reason I ask is because I just asked Lenny White this from uh, Westville, the exact same question. So I just want to hear if you're hearing the same thing. Yeah. So 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 for urban centers, we're having the infrastructure conversation, but for rural centers, they don't provide infrastructure. So so and and I'm sure their challenges are different. So I'm not saying that they're just you know sitting back without challenges. I know they're having different challenges, and roads are one of them, and things like that. But it, it has always bothered me that as a town, we're expected to pay essentially for everything. But then there's another group of municipalities that aren't expected to pay for much. And then they come, you know, the other levels of government will come back and say, well, how come you can't afford this? Well, because we're paying for this <laughs> and you're treating us as if we're, we're, I want to say equals because we're equals, but do you know what I mean? Like we're, you're treating us as if we have all the same issues. So I have to pay for road, hundred percent of my roads because I'm a town, but if I'm a rural municipality, I don't have to pay for most of my roads. I have a municipal police force, which means I pay hundred percent for my police force, but I subsidize the RCMP in a community that only pays for 80%. Um, I have pipes in the ground I have to pay for, but a rural municipality would be on a well and, and a septic. So they don't have those challenges. Um, so it, that is where we're we're having the same conversation as towns, but we're not kind of equally yoked when it comes to that issue, uh, you know, municipally across the province. But again, I'm not, I don't want to frame this as poor me, not poor them. I know that that rural municipalities have challenges and we need we need to be supportive of them as well. David, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. My pleasure. In a step towards fostering an inclusive community and combating racism and discrimination, Mayor Reed Hammer Jackson of Kamloops, British Columbia, officially declared the city's participation in the Canadian Commission for UNESCO's Coalition of Inclusive Municipalities. On July 25th, Kamloops Councillor Nancy Beppel proposed that the BC City join the coalition, citing inclusivity as a central tenet of the council's strategic plan. The motion received unanimous support during the council meeting on September 26, 2023. Now, the move underlines the city's dedication to fostering the, an environment of tolerance, respect, and understanding among its diverse populace. Now, the Coalition of Inclusive Municipalities, which currently boasts 96 Canadian municipalities, include prominent names like Vancouver, Victoria, Prince George, and William Lake which operate a network aimed at enhancing policies against racism, discrimination, exclusion, and intolerance. Members of the coalition actively share experiences and resources while striving to align with the commitments outlined by the organization. Mayor Reed Hammer Jackson emphasized the significance of the city's decision at the signing, stating, quote, Kamloops has welcomed a wealth of new immigrants in a short amount of time, adding to the richness and diversity of our community. Growing pains are natural, which makes us work to address racism and discrimination, both timely and important. It's why Council's new strategic plan focuses on reducing barriers for underrepresented groups. I'm looking forward to seeing what we can learn from other members of this coalition and hope to bring more awareness to some of the great work already being done in Kamloops, end quote. Now, the Coalition of Inclusive Municipalities, working in conjunction with UNESCO and the Canadian Commission for UNESCO, embodies a vital step towards nurturing harmony and understanding within communities. Kamloops' participation in this transformative coalition serves as a beacon of hope, setting the stage for a more inclusive and equitable future for all residents. Join us on Municipal Affairs and let your brand shine where it matters most. 
in the heart of local communities. Get in touch today and learn how you can make a meaningful impact on municipalities from coast to coast to coast here in Canada. Your success is our mission, and together we can build stronger, thriving communities together. Reach out today. Denver's got to a boiling point at the October 3rd Harrison Hot Springs Council meeting, leaving residents and officials reeling from the unexpected turn of events. While tensions seemed to be strained at the beginning of the meeting, civility was mostly on display until Mayor Ed Woods began addressing business arriving from the previous minutes. The atmosphere at the meeting quickly turned acrimonious as Mayor Woods' motion to remove Councillor Fascio from his chair for the remainder of the meetings, only 10 minutes into that council meeting. And finally, as whereas, if a member takes any action, that member shall be ordered by a majority vote of council or on the order of the mayor or presiding member to leave their seat for that meeting. And in the case of their refusing to do so, may on order of the mayor or presiding member be removed from the meeting by a peace officer. However, if a member offending subsection 6F, which is what I just read, apologizes to the council, the council may by majority vote permit them to resume their seat. And that as Councillor Fascio untook action prohibited by bylaw by releasing distorted confidential information from the closed meeting, I order you to leave your seat for the meeting. The mayor citing an alleged breach of confidentiality for divulging sensitive in-camera information to the public from a previous council meeting asked Council Fascio to leave his seat which Fascio asked for more details about the removal. What are you referring to? Yeah. You've been ordered to leave your What seat. are you referring to? You're out of order. What are you referring to? What if he leaves, I leave. You can ask the council. If he leaves, I leave. You're Simple as that. What if you have to give me, tell me what I'm, what you're accusing you of. You released information from a closed meeting that's on this consent, on this agenda. Which part of the agenda are you referring to? So I'm referring to the closed meetings. You're under order, sir, to please remove yourself from this meeting. What are you referring to? You have an option, sir. Oh, right. You have order. order. I would suggest you order. order. Have that order. No. You're out of order, counselor. You're out of order, your worship. You have been ordered to remove yourself from this meeting, or you may apologize. And council will decide. I apologize for what? I have to know what I'm for apologizing. Releasing the minutes, the, the conversation from the closed meeting that was just adopted. Which closed meeting are you making reference to? Sir. Is that page 17? Sir. You've been asked, you've been ordered to. And who have I released this to? After an intense exchange between the mayor and councillor, Wood began to call the councillor out of order. All I'm asking for is, what am I supposed to have released? That's all I'm asking. You have released confidential information from a closed from the closed meeting that we just adopted the minutes with. Who to? Mr. Um, Mayor, if I can make the point again, we cannot discuss items that were in a in-camera meeting. Therefore, you cannot answer Councillor Fascio's question. I'm, so I'm suggesting that you, you rise you have call, a, you, call, a, call a closed meeting. You have a choice. You can apologize for it. You know what it is. What? You're out of order. What am I apologizing for? I do not know what you're referring to. I have Mr. ordered Mayor. you removed. Once the floodgates burst, members of the public in attendance at the meeting began getting involved in what seemed to be a stand with the councillor. Councillor. got a right to know. What out of order. Out of order. Right to know. Everybody in a court of law, you have a right to know. Out of know. order, councillor. So are you. Yeah. Mayor Wood, would you please. You're out of order. I am not out of order. No, we're not out of order. I am requesting. You're order. out of order, counselor. I am not out of order, Mayor Wood. Councillor. It is, uh, it is absolutely Council unacceptable. Councillor Vidal, you're out of order. Not a liar. The mayor gave the councillor one final warning to remove himself from the council meeting then. Councillor Fascio, this is the final time. You can apologize. 
or remove yourself from this meeting so we can proceed. We have a busy agenda. What am I apologizing for? You're so apologizing for releasing confidential information from a closed meeting of which we just adopted. And you have proof of that. You know of it, sir. You have proof of that. You have a choice. I, I'm, only, I'm, I'm asking a fair question. Do you have proof of that? Under order of the mayor, you are to remove yourself from the meeting. While what Councillor Fascio was being accused of leaking to the public was never fully mentioned at this meeting, as it would have caused one of the other councillors or the mayor to breach in-camera confidentiality, the public meeting ended shortly after and moved to an in-camera session of council. Now, the Village Council isn't a stranger to conflict. Earlier this year, in March, Mayor Ed Wood announced that he had received an official letter from the Harrison Hot Springs Council signed by the rest of the council saying they have no confidence in the mayor. Now, ironically, on October 12th, Harrison Hot Springs held a special council meeting where Pool Consulting gave a five-hour council meeting on team building. Councillor Fascio was in attendance at said meeting. Last Friday, the city of Surrey, British Columbia, announced a bold step in its ongoing battle against the transition to the Surrey Police Service. The city of Surrey has officially lodged a petition with the Supreme Court of British Columbia, seeking a judicial review of the provincial government's order from July to proceed with the transition. In July, Public Safety Minister Mike Farnworth said that the city did not have a plan to scrap the transition that would ensure the preservation of adequate law enforcement resources in the city, putting public safety at risk. In his own statement after the city put out their news release on Friday, Farnworth described the legal action as extremely disappointing and said taxpayers will end up footing the bill for this court case. Quote, People in Surrey want the uncertainty over who will police their city to end. They want this debate to be over, end quote. Now, the transition proposed by the province has been met with strong opposition from the city, primarily due to the potential increase in tax burdens on the residents of the community. In light of the city's existing affordability challenges, Mayor Brenda Locke has expressed deep concerns about the potential financial strains this transition might impose on her taxpayers. In a statement, Mayor Locke emphasized the city's steadfast commitment to halting the proposed police transition, citing the extensive burden it would place on Surrey's taxpayers without ensuring any significant public safety benefits. Quote, my team and I were elected to stop the proposed police transition. Surrey simply cannot accept the extraordinary burden that our taxpayers will face as the result of a provincial order that will not deliver any public safety benefit, end quote. Respected legal expert on policing and public safety, Peter German, has been brought on board to this issue, according to the city. Echoing the mayor's sentiments, German emphasized the city of council's well-thought-out plan to retain the Royal Canadian Mountain Police, stating that it's not only in the best interest of the taxpayers, but also crucial for ensuring public safety. According to German, the four warnings regarding increased operational costs and challenges in recruiting frontline officers for the Surrey Police Service have all materialized, compelling the city to take necessary action in the interest of the public. Apart from the legal petition, the city has also directly communicated its persistent concerns to the province through an official letter reiterating its steadfast stance against the proposed transition. Join us on Municipal Affairs and let your brand shine where it matters most, in the heart of local communities. Get in touch today and learn how you can make a meaningful impact on municipalities from coast to coast to coast here in Canada. Your success is our mission, and together we can build stronger, thriving communities together. Reach out today. The town of Westville, Nova Scotia, continues to mourn the loss of former councillor Megan Bragg. Preparations are underway for a by-election scheduled for Saturday, November 4th. Bragg, a 37-year-old healthcare professional and active member of the Westville Council, tragically lost her battle with cancer on July 31st of this year. 
Her untimely passing left a significant void in the hearts of Westville residents who have long admired her for her dedication and fervor for public service. Reflecting on her own life, Bragg's obituary revealed her exceptional spirit and unwavering commitment to her responsibilities as a counselor and as a community member. Quote, my whole life, I have been one to reach milestones ahead of schedule. I had my beautiful, life-changing daughter, Arlie, at age 21. I was elected as a town of Westville counselor and deputy mayor at 35. And now I have passed away at 37 years old. I've always cherished and thrived in my independence, and I cannot forget or diminish the amazing network of family and community that I had around me, end quote. The upcoming by-election has sparked considerable interest and anticipation as the town prepares to select a new councillor who will continue the legacy and values upheld by Councillor Bragg. The new councillor will be tasked with a responsibility of representing the community and addressing the pressing issues faced by Westville stepping into the role for the remaining year of Bragg's term. Now, an exclusive interview, Mayor Lenny White of Westville shares his insights into the remarkable contributions of Councillor Bragg and the profound impact she had on her community. Mayor White, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, I appreciate you taking time to talk about the upcoming by-election on November 4th in the town of Westville, Nova Scotia. Unfortunately, on July 31st, uh, Councillor Bragg did pass away from her battle with cancer. Uh, I, I know that four people have stepped forward to put their name forward to replace Councillor uh, Bragg, but I want to start with the sort of the overarching question here. Um, this is not a by-election that you probably were expecting. This is not a by-election that you probably wanted, but it's needed. Can you just talk to me about, uh, for a moment, about Councillor Bragg's impact on the town of Westville? Wow. Uh, yeah, this is, it's, I'm still, I must say, before we begin, I'm still pretty much in disbelief. I mean, it, she passed away on July 31st, and uh, I still have times when I, I, it's difficult for me to to process and understand that she's gone. Uh, uh, Megan, and and I, I'm glad you asked. I, there's nothing gives me more pleasure than to talk about Megan, um, if I can get through it. Um, Megan, Megan was an exceptional uh, person, uh, you know, a young lady, 37 years of age, uh, uh, when she passed away, uh, had so many skills and so many positive attributes uh, and so much more to give to, to, to not just this community, but, you know, I, I fully expect it, you know, provincially, federally for that matter in years to come. I just saw her as a, a shining star, uh, someone who had tremendous insight for her age uh, and someone I relied upon, you know, as a, as somewhat of an elderly person, uh, to to a better understanding of things that uh, you know pertain to equity and uh, uh, inclusion and accessibility, which are her passion. Uh, she she just every everything that we dealt with on council, she put through that lens for us and and for me in particular. Um, and and you know just had uh, such insight and and desire to 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 make change. And the fact that this happened so quickly, I got to tell you, uh, you know, within a month of being diagnosed and, and probably a little less than a month, the time she was diagnosed, she passed away. And I had an opportunity during that time period, particularly the last couple of weeks, um, to discuss with her some things and um, through, through, uh, you know, through texting, uh, she didn't want to talk on the phone. And I think it was because, you know, she didn't want me to hear her, uh, you know, let alone see her, uh, the condition that she, she ended up being in. But, you know, the remarkable strength that she had right up until the very end was, uh, you know, the epitome of who she was as a person. She wasn't thinking about herself, even at that stage. She was more concerned about Leg, you know, somewhat concerned about legacy and going forward and disappointed in the things that she wasn't going to be able to do more than, you know, you know, for the community and, and for the greater good, um, more than personal things. Um, and so 
one thing that we struck upon, I, you know, I had an opportunity. Well, what would you, she, she said to me at one point in time, if, if there are donations that come in my name after my passing, uh, here's what I'd like to see happen. I'd like to see it go towards an accessible playground uh, in the town. And I said, well, number one, there definitely will be donations coming, Megan. Uh, I can assure you of that. And number two, yes, we will definitely do that. So we are embarked upon doing that. And after that conversation, a day or so later, I asked her, I said, you know, we, we want to do this and we'll set that up uh, immediately so that, that happens. Uh, would it be okay if we name the, the playground, uh, you know, Megan's place? And she said, basically said, well, let me think about it, right? I mean, this is Megan again, let me think about it. She wasn't looking for that. Um, and so a day later, the next day, she did say, I thought about it. And so I'll be okay with that if, if, if you want to do that. So that's what we, so we're, we're naming it Megan's place. We, we've undertaken, we started the, uh, the fundraising uh, immediately after, after she passed. Um, and we're through GoFundMe and, and, and one major contribution that uh, is still uh, uh, confidential, but we know it's coming. Uh, we're up to close to the $100,000 mark, uh, but we're, under, we're undertaking a major uh, campaign uh, that we're going to roll out here in the next couple of weeks with a committee, a cabinet uh, of people and so on uh, to raise the remaining funds that we know we're going to need. Accessible playgrounds, by the way, are extremely expensive, <laughs> as anyone that's been involved in them probably knows. Uh, we've learned, but we'll, we'll, we'll make it happen. I, I, I say to people, first time in my 74 years of life that I've ever made a commitment to someone, you know, literally on their deathbed. And I made that commitment to Megan and I, and uh, I told her, you know, as long as I'm around, as long as I have a voice, uh, you know, this will happen, Megan. So I, I'm committed to that uh, more than I've ever been committed to anything. And, you know, I, I just, uh, like I said, uh, Megan in the beginning, I met Megan, she was on a committee that I was involved in through my council work, and she was at the time not on council, obviously, she was, uh, she worked for the Department of Health, and she was there as a representative for the Department of Health. And I immediately, you know, and I, this is not unlike other people that I've talked to, uh, the first time you met her, you, you realized, here's somebody special. You're somebody that has some, something to contribute. And so I did talk to her about possibility, you know, coming and looking at getting involved in council. And she came to me several times prior to the election in 2020 and and um, then decided to do it and uh, was very successful. And um, just uh, a tremendous loss. That's all I can the say. So if I'm not mistaken, and correct me if I'm wrong here, May, uh, uh, Lenny, um, the link to the GoFundMe page is still active. People can yes. still donate. Um, yes. For those who are listening to this and uh, watching this right now, if you want to donate to this cause of building an ac accessible playground for the people of Westville to sort of honor the memory of Councillor Bragg, the link is in the show notes. So scroll down if you're watching this on YouTube or if you're listening to this on uh, uh, Apple Podcast or wherever you're listening to this right now and donate $10, $15. It does help and it does uh, honor a memory of someone who I, I, I didn't know her, but as I told uh, uh, Mayor White here a few seconds ago, I've, I'm going through sort of a challenging time in my life with cancer. Unfortunately, uh, we're still struggling, but here we are. Um, please donate. Uh, I'm going to be making a contribution from the show into this uh, GoFundMe page uh, right after this interview. So please do it because I think it's an important, important endeavor that the community is uh, taking on here to sort of honor a counselor. So there's my little plug there for a second. Thank you very much for that, Chris. Um, I do want to talk about the by-election though. So four yes. people have sort of put their hand up to run in the position uh, that was vacated on July 31st. Um, I, I do want to ask, these are big shoes that are, have to be filled. And I can imagine you as mayor are, have talked to these four potential candidates or are going to talk to these four potential candidates over this campaign period. Um, what advice are you giving them to sort of make sure that they're prepared when they enter into that council chambers on November 5th or November 6th when they're sworn yeah. in? One of the things that I want them all to know when I, you know, when I have the opportunity to do this is when this council, uh, and, and and just so, so it's clear, this is the second time that this has happened to this council in its term of four years. Um, the election was in 2020. 
um, we had obviously Megan and 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 we had Betty Jean Sutherland uh, was the other female counselor. So we had two female counselors and two male. Um, we had two younger counselors in Megan and 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 Mitchell McGregor, who's you know it's the same age sort of thing. And we had two uh, older counselors in Betty Jean and 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 Clary McKinnon, and. So that was in 2020, in, in the fall of 2020, in October 2020. And um, Betty Jean, unfortunately, passed away suddenly in, in December of, of 2021. And so this is like, uh, it, it's hard to fathom, but this is the second time we've gone through this uh, in, in a short period of time as a small town council. So it's, it's very difficult. Um, so what I was going to say is when that council came came on, um, you know, I said to them, so what do we want to do in four years? You know, you, you, you want to spend your time productively and you want to be at the end of it, be able to say, here's what we accomplished. So we sat down and we came up with a basically a statement of principle and a, a goals, uh, not not a strategic plan, but just uh, how we were going to operate and, and what we wanted to accomplish. And we we wrote those down. We all signed it and we actually put it up on the council wall. So it's there. So I want the, the four candidates to know this was the basis on which this council decided to operate. And we want to continue that for the remaining year that we have as, as a council. So, you know, we want to be sure that you're okay, you know, that you're, that you understand this and you're on board. The big thing, the big thing was that, you know, we wanted to make decisions based on good information, reliable information, um, and if, if we need expert information, expert advice uh, before we make decisions, number one, and that we have great transparency and inclusiveness, uh, openness. Uh, and so we've undertaken to do all those things. And I can tell you that, you know, uh, Megan called me out a couple of times, uh, Mitchell, the younger ones in particular, called me out a few times to say, oh, wait now, uh, Lenny, that doesn't fit with what we, you know, we can't make that decision right now. We need this because here's what we've said we would do. And uh, rightly so. And so, yeah, it's uh, that's the, sort of the key that I want to uh, impart upon them, uh, whoever's the successful candidate uh, and prior to becoming candidate to know here's what's going on. And, and some of the things that we're working on, perhaps, you know, so there's so they have some knowledge of uh, what we determined to be our our, our important uh, areas. But, yeah, it's uh, no one fills another person's shoes completely. Let's face it. Everybody brings something to the table. So I expect that, you know, the, the next person will bring uh, equally uh, something uh, of a positive nature to to a council, to this council. It'll be a you know, the second time we've changed our council in, 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 in three years. So pretty amazing when you think about it. Um, one of the candidates, by the way, just so you know, was, uh, is the former mayor that, that I replaced, uh, you know, uh, so he certainly has the experience of council and knows what the ins and outs of council are, but, um, but I'd still have the same conversation with him if I was able to. Yeah. And I will. At an October 12th special council meeting of, uh, at the October 12th special meeting of North Bay City Council, councillors unanimously imposed a 90-day loss of pay on Councillor Sarah Inge as a consequence of her multiple breaches of the municipality's code of conduct. Councillors took the decisive action after a detailed report by the integrity commissioners of the city was released, which found that Inch has harassed Deputy Mayor Maggie Horsfield through various online platforms earlier this year. The Special Integrity Commissioner's report highlighted Inch's use of email and Facebook to harass Deputy Mayor Horsfield. Despite the penalty, Inch is expected to continue attending all council functions and carrying out her duties about without pay for the next three months. Now, during the meeting, which was held to talk about the consequences and penalties of Inch's actions, the councillor accepted her full responsibility of her actions. but. Mayor Peter Shakirko spoke over the councillor and threatened to suspend the meeting until Inch spoke about the topic at hand, the penalties. I'm here with you today um, with a profound sense of responsibility and humility. Uh, recent events have brought to light my breaches of code of conduct, specifically in my emails and my social media posts. I want to express my sincere apologies to each member of this council and to our community and the community we serve the constituents. Um, my words and actions, although not intended to cause harm, 
have fallen short of the standards we expect from our public representatives. I acknowledge the impact they have had, and I take full accountability for my behavior. I assure you that I'm reflecting deeply on my actions and the responsibility that comes with this position. I've also experienced harassment myself, um, yelling, Councilor bullying, Inch. unwelcome negative comments Councilor on Inch. my personal life. Councillor Inch, you're out of order. Councillor Inch, you are out of order. Please refrain to the matter that we're discussing tonight. Okay. Um, so I'm committed to learning from this experience and to making amends. Um, I will actively work on fostering a more respectful and collaborative environment within this council. I would like that very much. Our community deserves leaders who can engage in constructive dialogue and who set an example of professionalism and decorum together. Moving forward, I will be more mindful of my words and actions, both online and offline. I am open to discussions and suggestions and criticism from my fellow councillors and from the public. Together, I feel we should rebuild the trust that has been strained and work towards a more harmonious and effective council. In light of recent events, in the spirit of reconciliation, I propose a solution where Councillor Horsfield and I share the cost of the Integrity Commission. Councillor Inch, you this are out of order. Councillor Inch, Councillor Inch, Councillor Inch, could you please mute her microphone? If you How will not respect, record? if you will not respect, you are out of order, Councillor Inch. Tonight we are speaking regarding the penalty imposed, period. I'm, I'm, I'm Councillor Inch, Councillor Inch. Councillor Inch, that is not part of the solution for this evening's meeting. If you wish to yeah. discuss, Councillor Inch, please yeah. do not interrupt. Councillor Inch, yes, I would ask you that you refrain while I explain exactly what we are doing here this evening. And please listen to what I have to say. We are discussing a penalty based on the Integrity Commissioner's ruling, period. We are not talking about other solutions. Those will be left for another time and another place for that discussion. So please, I would ask that you, if you have something to say regarding the penalty that is in front of us, the two items, a reprimand or a suspension of remuneration. That is the only things that we're going to be discussing tonight. We are not referring to the Integrity Commissioner's report the cost, anything regarding that this evening. So please, I would ask that you limit your comments, otherwise I will stop the proceedings. The decision to suspend Councillor Inch's pay for 90 days was reached unanimously during the special meeting of Council. Now, Deputy Mayor Horsfield, in her remarks to the Council, said that actions have consequences. Actions have consequences. And we're here today to accept the report of the Integrity Commissioner and decide a reprimand for which Councillor Inch breached the Code of Conduct over and over and over again. A conversation would not have stopped her pattern of behavior. The harassment continued even after the complaint was filed. The simple fact of the matter is, is that we wouldn't be here today if the Code of Conduct had not been broken. We have a Code of Conduct. We have a process for investigating any breaches. The process was followed, and the outcome is that she breached the code of conduct on all three accounts. If the cost of the report is such a factor, then a 90-day pay suspension is in order to recoup some of the costs of her actions. Acting Integrity Commissioner Nicole Singh investigated the complaint filed by Deputy Mayor Horsfield. Singh's finding pointed to a series of troubling emails and social media posts from Inch, which targeted Horsefield's age, pregnancy, and ability to fulfill her responsibilities. The commissioner explicitly concluded that Inch's actions did constitute harassment according to the City of North Bay's Code of Conduct. Join us on Municipal Affairs and let your brand shine where it matters most in the heart of local communities. Get in touch today and learn how you can make a meaningful impact on municipalities from coast to coast to coast here in Canada. Your success is our mission, and together we can build stronger, thriving communities together. Reach out today. 
By-election news from across the country, 22-year-old Ethan Williams was acclaimed as the newest counselor for the town of Bay Bulls, Newfoundland, and Labrador, while Arlen Mundell of Leroy, Saskatchewan was victorious over Don Brown, Mundell won the by-election 54 to 12 votes. Multiple by-elections are on the horizon across Canada, but over the next few weeks, the village of Bursker, Alberta, heads to the polls, which will be taking place on October 17th to elect a new council member. On October 18th, the town of Nipawin, Saskatchewan, will be electing a new mayor after the departure of former mayor Rennie Harper earlier this year. In Beaumont, Alberta, on October 23rd, residents will be voting for two new council members. The town of Bygone, Saskatchewan, will be heading to the polls on October 25th to elect a new councillor, while the RM of Lumsden will be voting on the same day to elect a new councillor as well. Now, in the province of New Brunswick, though, 10 communities will be heading to the polls on October 23rd to fill 14 council vacancies. In Boyeravage, residents will be heading to the polls to elect one councillor at large, and a councillor for Ward 6. In Fredericton Junction, residents will be heading to the polls to elect a new mayor. Grand Lake residents of Ward 4 will be heading to the polls to elect a new councillor. In the rural community of Hanwell, residents of Ward 4 will be electing a new councillor, while the residents of the entire rural community will be electing a new councillor at large as well. In Nugent's, residents will be electing one councillor at large. And in Riverview, residents will be picking from four candidates to fill one councillor at large vacancy. In Southern Victoria, three candidates are vying for one position on council. And finally, three people are running to fill two councillor at large vacancies on Tracy Council. We will have the full results of all these by elections on the Cross Border Interviews website at www.crossborderinterviews.ca when they become available. But well, that's all for today's Municipal Affair Report of October 16th, 2023. We'd like to extend our heartfelt gratitude to all of those who have tuned in and watched or even listened. Your support means the world to us. Remember, our mission is to bring you the most important municipal stories from across Canada, and we can't do it without you. So please keep those stories coming. Share your municipal news, your concerns, and triumphs with us. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter in our communities. Your voices are essential, and we're here to amplify them. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking. Mm-hmm.